other passages. I think the third part, which is the fact that the pastor uh, needs support, we'll save that for next week. And um, I want to finish up some of the passages we did not finish this morning. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter number 34. Again, learning about the good shepherd. What makes a good leader in the home? What makes a, a good pastor? And listen, we should evaluate everything in our lives by the Word of God. You know what we don't evaluate? Well, He just makes me feel good. You know, you can feel good about a lot of things that are sinful. Is it Bible? Is it the Bible characteristics of the man that are matching up if it's not and listen I, I i encourage people to measure me by this standard because as a pastor i have to set out to mold my life it, it starts being a christian mold your life according to the word of god when you see things are wrong in your life don't ignore them work on getting them things right and it doesn't matter what perspective it is, whether it's the issue of self-righteousness, whether it's an issue of arrogance, whether it's an issue of pride, whether it's an, whatever your issue is, that's the thing you've got to work on. And so don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. So as I begin to evaluate this, there's several of these things. I said, man, I need to work on this bad. But Ezekiel 34, we're introduced to some shepherds here. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flocks? Amen. Amen. How many pastors are interested in taking care of their needs but their focus is not about the flock. I'm going to tell you, the reason a pastor is warned about not liking filthy lucre is because he'll begin to learn uh, to love things rather than loving his flock. Listen, you take a man who's covetous, he cannot keep his mind on ministry. The only thing he thinks about is another buck. Next thing you know, he'll be compromising the truth in order to pacify people who want something other than the truth. And so that thing of money is a big deal. To, you say it's not a big deal. Sure it is. It's a billion dollar market in the United States of America alone. This um, uh, pastor, these big blowing and going pastors of these big churches, it's a market for them. Listen, it's not, it's not about the truth for them. It's about making money. It's about having another million dollar, a couple million dollar jet and a, a, a several million dollar home and uh, a, a half a million dollars uh, on, on this piece of property, half a million dollars on that. It's about, it's about living high on the hog. Listen, I, I read a, a pastor, um, I can't remember his name right now. I, it was one of these big highfalutin um, um, Joe Osteen type pastors, might have been T.D. Jakes, um, uh, I mean, and spending $50,000 on a suit, one suit, I don't know about you, I can buy probably about three cars, maybe four on that, that'll last me for years, it doesn't make any kind of sense, the kind of mindset of these so-called pastors, look at verse 3, Ye eat the fat, and clothe ye with the wool. You will kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. Look at verse 4. The disease have, uh, ye have not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which is sick, neither have ye bound up that which is broken, neither, um, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which is lost, but uh, with force... And cruelty have you ruled them. Didn't we learn about that this morning? What's our word this morning? Brutish. You know what's mentioned here again? Not Brutus. That's a guy on Popeye. <laughs> you're listening. Praise the Lord, you're listening. That word brutish is something we should not be in our lives. But notice the force. We're going to go through the force and the cruelty that's here. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I, for the life of me, 
people have tolerated pastors that are cruel and and show a, have a show of force because they are doctrinally sound. That's what they say. Well, listen, if a pastor does not know how to restrain himself and doesn't have temperance in his life, he's not doctrinally sound. You may think he is, but he's not doctrinally sound. Now, I encourage you, there's two things that are mentioned in the, in the Word of God. Doctrine and the word sound doctrine. You know what sound doctrine is? Actions. It's actions. You know what God's more interested in in your life? Actions. Uh, Titus 2 speaks of sound doctrine. Multi multiple, And you read about it. You know what's not mentioned in Titus 2? There's nothing taught about the virgin birth. Nothing taught about rightly dividing. Uh, nothing taught about the Trinity. It's not that kind of doctrine. You know what it is? It says, hey, look, you tell them old ladies they need to not be double-tongued and not false accusers. That's sound doctrine in God's book. It says, hey, you old... Teach these old men they need to be grave and temperate. And then it gives a charge to the young men and the young ladies. It's actions. When it talks about sound doctrine in the Scriptures, it's that, why do we ignore that? And think just because we have the other facts right, that God we're acceptable in the sight of God because we have this knowledge. I know people who, who can give you the dispensation. I know people who can tell you all kinds. They can quote every single one of the Ten Commandments in order just perfect. They have all these facts right. Facts right. They can show you the difference between the Jew, the Gentile, and the church. And they'll run all the passages for you. They can go to Daniel, uh, 70th week, and explain it way better than I did. They got all their end time order of events out and they can tell you prophecy all day long they know these facts but their life stinks that's not doctrine that's not sound doctrine that's not somebody who is who is who is is sound in their, their faith or even in their doctrine the living of it listen can you restrain your flesh bible talks about us not behaving ourselves unseemly that's that's one of the definitions of charity hello unseemly what does that mean weird odd it's amazing how these are spelled out look at verse number four the disease you've not strengthened this is what i know when people come through that door this is how they're going to be coming through that door they're going to be diseased by sin they have lived in sin for so long that that sin is going to be plaguing their lives. Listen, they're going to be sick and they're going to be broken. Do you see that? Our job, when we see people who are diseased, sick, and broken, is not to make them worse. If you went to a doctor and every patient of a doctor Every patient of a doctor, after he treated them, became worse. Would you keep going to that doctor? Would you? Well, let me ask you something. Why do people keep going to the same pastor when they see that that pastor, every time somebody deals with that pastor, every time somebody has a run-in with that pastor, they're worse off than they were when they started. And yet church people will, will, will not make a judgment about that. Let me tell you something. We need to be promoting healing in our church. And let me tell you, there's people going to come through the door, and if you don't get to the point where you say, hey, I want them to be better off uh, five weeks down the road, I want them to be this point in their life. You've got to set goals. Do you do that? When you look at people, do you say, oh, man, look how horrible that guy. Look at Luca. Man, look how bad off he is. It's crazy how people are, isn't it? Why don't you look and say, man, i got to figure out how to get Luca from here to here in his life. It, he'll be a better man if I can get him to be strong over here. That's what we need to be doing in our lives. People come in, they got messes. They do. I, but look, look in the mirror. You don't remember the mess you had last week? I'm just saying, our, our job is to help people heal. 
A pastor who's not binding up the wounded is not doing his job. I get people all the time, all the time, Preacher, are you going to visit them again? They didn't listen to you last time. Are you going to visit them again? What are you doing over there? I've been in this thing long enough to know I've visited people who did not listen to me the first time, second time, third time, fourth time. But I've also lived long enough to see people show up that I visited over and over and got absolutely nowhere with. So I thought. And one day, the light bulb came on. And they showed up. Said, I want to get right. I want to do what's right going forward. Praise the Lord for that. But you know what? This is the problem. Most people do not want to do that. You know why? It takes time. If you're going to bind up a wound, if you had a, the, the illustration here is sheep. What sound does a sheep make, kids? Go ahead, you almost said it. Bah. Right? What if that sheep was out there going, bah, 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 bah. think there's something wrong with it? You learn to hear the voice of your sheep, don't you? You know what? You go over there and you see that sheep has a broken leg. Now my daddy would have gone out, going inside, and he said that he had about a five cent remedy for that round, for that uh, disease. But listen, the shepherd knows that the sheep has a lot of value. That wool is valuable. That sheep is very valuable. To warm in the flock. You know what he does? He goes over there and, and binds that wound. Binds it. He, he straightens out the broken part. Wraps it up. Goes out every day. Maybe three times a day. And checks on it. Are you okay? I'm you little lamb. Here's some food. Here's some food. And you know what happens one day? That lamb jumps up and is standing up. And walking. Next thing you know, we can take the wrap off. The lamb's out running now. See, that's the way we need to be with people in our lives. We need to realize they come, they're broken, they seem almost useless at that point. But if you can get them to the point where they're healed and they can function on their own, now they're a benefit to the whole flock. Now they're a benefit and a blessing to the whole flock. And that's where we've got to understand people are going to come through those doors. They're going to be broken hearted. It talks about healing the broken. Bound up that which is broken. You know where I find... Let me show you a passage that is actually missing. Oh, we'll come back here. Hold your hand there. A passage that's actually missing in a lot of new Bibles. Luke chapter number 4. Luke 4. <clears throat> There's a part of this passage. Jesus as the good shepherd. Jesus as the good shepherd says something in Luke 4 verse 18. That's actually out of these new Bibles. These new Bibles take this portion out that I want to show you here. Jesus says this in Luke 4, verse 18. Luke chapter number 4, verse 18. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me, watch, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recover the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty the bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. One of the purposes of Jesus' coming was to heal the brokenhearted. He said He bound up the, uh, the, the wound of the broken, bounding up that broken. Let me tell you something. If you're going to help somebody who's brokenhearted, what's one of the main things that's going to take? There's a lot of things it takes. But what's one of the main things it's going to take? Compassion. Yep. How about physically what's it going to take? How about time? Listen to me kids. I want to tell you something. 
old, old alike. If you're going to help somebody who's downhearted, who's broken hearted, you might just have to go sit at their house and just listen. Just let them tell you everything that's bothering them. Let them cry. Cry with them. Hold their hand. Hug them. Love on them. And let them just pour it out. You know, a lot of people don't have that compassion. As a shepherd, I must have that compassion. And I encourage you as a leader in your home, as part of this body, you need to have that compassion. Not every time is the time to go over and say, well, if you hadn't done this, you, this would have happened. If you hadn't done that, this would have happened. Sometimes you just need to be there. People are broken hearted. You know what? A lot of people live with a lot of trouble, don't they? A lot of bad things have happened to people in their lives, whether it's young or old. A lot of bad things have happened. And people are scarred by those things. And they're broken hearted about it. If you're not the kind of person who can listen to them, you're not going to be able to help them. Listen, that sounds so weak and wimpy to some hardcore people. But it is God's way of healing. You know, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Did he heal your heart? There's been a lot of hurt in your life that Jesus had to take time to heal. You know what healed? That word getting in you and starting to make you strong. Jesus there comforting you. You know, there's a part that he left behind when he went to heaven. What was, what's another name of the Holy Spirit? Huh? Isn't he also called the Comforter? Jesus left you a part of Him just to comfort you. Isn't that a blessing? Let's go back. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. Notice what it says here in verse number 4. It says they've... Um, ye have brought again... Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Here, here's something that's a problem. And um, you, you see a lot of preachers, when, when people are offended at things, a lot of times they say, well, that's their problem, not mine. Have you ever heard a preacher say that? I have. That's their problem, not mine. They need to get right. You know what this says here? It says you've not brought... And neither have you brought again that which was driven away. You know what we find in Luke chapter number 15? Go to Luke 15. Hold your hand there and stay, stay right there. Let's go to Luke 15. Not Luca, but Luke 15. Luke 15. I'm picking on you. That's it. That's it. I like picking on you. Ask my wife, if I pick on you, that means I love you. Right? It's like a booger. You just got to pick on it, right? <laughs> oh. Look what it says here in Luke 15. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured at his saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Boy, I can't resist every time I read that passage saying, Amen! Because that's me. Look at Jesus trying to straighten them out. He said, and he spake this parable unto them saying, What man of you having a, a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he had found it, he lay it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he cometh, he cometh home, he calleth his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have uh, found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that like, uh, likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Let me ask you something. It's funny, I hear these preachers. They got offended, they need to get right and come back. 
What did that uh, shepherd right there in that passage do? He left the 90 and 9 that were doing just fine. And he went out and said he sought. He's looking for that sheep. How did the sheep get back to the fold? He didn't make that sheep walk back. You know what? Sometimes as a pastor, sometimes a leader of your, of, of your home, you've got to put that little sheep on your shoulder because they're too weak, too worn out because of their sin. And you just got to carry them back. Say, come on back with me. When I get you back, I'm going to get you something to eat. I'm going to get you warmed up. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to help you heal. Bring you back to the fold. Guess what? Everybody's rejoicing. Everybody's rejoicing. Why is it sometimes, why is it sometimes that we think we've got to take this hardcore, heavy-fisted approach? That's not God's method. God don't deal with you like that. Now, there's a time when God lowers the boom and He's done with you. And he has to deal harshly. But would you please be honest and admit that God does not do that with you on a regular basis. He's always tender with you, gentle with you, bringing you back gently when you don't even deserve it. And so we should be that way with other people. Let's look at the last attribute in this passage. Notice he says, Neither have you sought with that which was lost, but with force and cruelty have you ruled them. Alright, so let me ask you this. If the problem with these if the problem with these pastors is with force and cruelty, they ruled them. What is the opposite? Because the opposite would be what we need to do, right? So if he if this pastor ruled them, this shepherd ruled them with force and cruelty. How is it that we should gather that we should behave that's pleasing to God? If force and cruelty is not pleasing to God, amen, what is pleasing to God? What's the opposite of that, would you say? Compassion. Leading. Gentleness is the opposite of force. Kindness. You said compassion. Tender. There's a passage that talks about us treating the young sheep, especially with tenderness. Now, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm confessing to you that as a young man, as a father, I did not have these attributes. My oldest three kids, my oldest two kids particularly, will tell you I did not have these attributes and I needed to have them. I'm glad I learned them. I wish I had learned them earlier than I did. Because it, it really took me a long time to learn them. But it's never too late to change when you know you're wrong. The first step is just admitting that you know you're wrong and getting it right and doing better going forward. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing weak about that. We need, we need to have the right heart, the opposite of these men. We've already seen twice. We've seen a brutish group. And we've seen force and cruelty here. We know that does not get the job done. Force and cruelty and brutish never gets the job done with anybody. It will scatter the sheep. And you know why some are scattered in our homes? You know why some are scattered in our churches? I'll tell you why. Because somebody tried to be brutish and cruel and force them. You cannot force righteousness. You won't be able to. You're better off setting the example like the prodigal son's father did so that they know where you stand. Being Listen, he didn't rail on him because he wanted his inheritance. He didn't say, oh, you're going to go blow it on a bunch of harlots. He knew pretty much where his son was going to go. He kind of had an idea where he's going. You know what he did? He still manifests love toward his son. He let him make his own decision about it. Obviously, he was mature enough to take care of himself at this point because he left home. 
when he had wasted all of that, his father did not say when he saw him, Aha! I told you so! You know what he said? Come on home. We got a feast ready for you. We're going to rejoice because finally, finally, you were lost. Now you're found. Now you've come to your senses. Come on home. That's the attitude we need to have. This, this and so many flocks are scattered now. You know, we, we look back and see the result of many years of cruelty in some churches and you'll, you'll, you'll recognize that it don't work. Force does not work. A brutish mentality, it doesn't work. You're going to be better off if you show people you love them, try to help them. You might not do everything right, but you need to have the right heart, tender heart. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Another passage on pastors that we need to look at. There's a lot of them. Did you know there was that many uh, passages in the Scriptures on shepherds, pastors? There's a lot, isn't it? We ain't even scratched the surface. These are just the big passages. There's a lot of little ones here, here and there. I'm trying to hopefully guide you. Maybe you can take some time to finish this study. And it's an eye-opening study. It's a, it's a time of reflection on what am I doing in my life and is it what I need to be doing. This is where this study started. This study, I didn't study this so I can correct you. I studied this so I can correct me. Because I have a problem. I, and listen, I've been evaluating everything about my life to make sure I'm the right kind of leader that's pleasing to God. I don't care about pleasing a man. I don't care about what people think about me. I care about what God thinks about me. And that's the only person I care about. Now, listen, in the process, if I can love you in return and you love me in return, that is a huge blessing. We're going to see that later. Hopefully next week we'll see that. I need your support. We'll, we'll get into that next week. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Woo, man, this whole passage is a good passage. Whole passage. But what I want to do is point out some highlights to you about this passage. I encourage you to read this whole passage. Take this passage home with you. But I, I want you to see, he says, starts out in verse number 1, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Notice they're not uniters, they're dividers. Is that clear? Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you your evil doings, saith the Lord. Listen. <coughs> he talks about feeding. Um, I had somebody say, Preacher, man, you're going to wear yourself out going visiting all these people. You just hear there, hear there, there. You know why I do it? Because I ran into passages like this trying to figure out how I need to be a pastor. And it tells me that's what I need to do. You know, a lot of pastors, most pastors, I say probably the bigger percentage of pastors. I'm not bashing them all because I don't know them all. But a big percentage of pastors has a group of people that they are comfortable with and they mostly hang out with only that group of people. Have you seen that? I've seen it. Listen. If they are part of your flock, they are worthy of your fellowship. And you need to make sure that you visit all of them. Because that is what unites, that's what strengthens the flock. Listen, I, I think what happens is, now sometimes we have to put more attention on where the problem's at, right? We have to spend more time with a certain individual trying to get them uh, the help they need. And you shouldn't be envious of that. But a pastor should make sure he's there for his entire flock. That's why I'm telling you, these big movements, they're not of God. You know why they're not of God? I'm talking about these big, big uh, uh, Oscar Meyer, what's her, what's her, Joyce Meyer, and um, 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 who's the other guy? In the Benny Hens and all this. Well, first of all, they got false doctrine. But the reason, one of the problems is that how does a pastor attend to the needs himself of 20,000 people? I'm sorry. 
What you should do is train a man. If we ever get to a point where this place is full and overflowing, my heart's desire would be to tra train a man for the ministry, just like they did in the Bible, and say, look, 25 of these people are from your neck of the woods, 15, 20 minutes away. Why don't you start a church or work out there and begin ministering to their needs because I can't minister to all the needs of these people. But you know why a lot of pastors will muscle through it? It's that. If I am able to somehow manage to keep all these people here, I can have more of this. That's why it's not important for people to be, who are pastors, to be covetous. Right? Listen, I'm thankful for what I get here, but it's a small salary. I'm thankful that people are trying to be a blessing to me. But I told this church many years ago, I'll do it for free. I did it for free three years in the park. I would do it free here. If it meant that the brethren could get a blessing out of it, I'd do it for free. That's the attitude we have to take. I, up until April, I worked full-time job. I got laid off in April. I intend to find a new job coming to the start of this year. I took a little sabbatical, as they like to say. It's been good for me. It would be good for the church. If I could spend the time studying that I'm spending now, but I also don't want to be a burden. That's the way a real pastor is supposed to think. He's not trying to put the burden on the flock. You understand? The burden should be shared. That's the way the church is supposed to be. But notice Jeremiah 23. He scatters, he's not visited, he's not feeding. Look at verse number 4. I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they, may, they shall uh, fear no more nor be dismayed neither shall they be lacking saith the Lord. Listen, you know what a, a good pastor is trying to do? You know why he feeds the sheep? He's trying to calm them. Listen, a pastor who really does love you He'll remove fear from your heart, dismay, and anything that's lacking. He's trying to feed you the Word of God so that you can settle down in your life for once. Listen, I'm telling you, the result of a bad pastor leaves people in fear. Because they don't, they're not taught. When I say feed, I'm talking about teaching the Word of God. The more the Word of God I feed you, and the less of my Word, but the more of the Word of God I feed you. Have you not seen it in this church? Sis, we've seen it. We've seen it in this church. I've seen people come here who were riddled with fear. Riddled with trouble. Come through this door, begin being taught the Word of God. You know what they start doing? They start settling down and saying, look, I trust God. He's got this under control. It's very clear to me now. Isn't that a blessing? What does that? The eloquence of the preacher? No. It's the feeding of the Word of God. You're right. It's feeding the word of God to the sheep will settle you. Look at verse number 14. Look at these attributes. How horrible is this, y'all? You tell me what these mega churches are riddled with. Uh, what, what's, the, um, what's the Hillsong Church? Bethel? Bethel. Caught up. Big blowing and going church, right? Caught up. You want to you guess what they're caught up in? An adultery scandal. Pastors committing adultery and have to step down, and now there's a new pastor there. Listen, it ain't just their churches. Churches are riddled with adultery, aren't they? Look what the problem was here. Verse 14, I've seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hand of the evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are uh, all of them unto me as Sodom and the habits there of Gomorrah. 
You know what? A good pastor will not strengthen the hand of evildoers. He's not going to give them fodder for their fire. You know what he's going to do? He's going to put that down. And he's going to strengthen the hand of the person who's doing right. That's a good pastor. And let me tell you something. You don't think that these pulpits are filled with adultery and lies? Listen, it was so even in the days of Jeremiah. One of the marks of Israel before they went bad. This is how you know this country is headed in a bad direction. The spiritual leadership was nothing but a bunch of fornicators and liars. And I'm telling you in this country, the majority of the pulpits are filled with this type garbage. And, I, and I'm telling you, it's getting to be more and more rampant in our country. Why is it so? It was the same in the days of uh, Jeremiah here. Same in his days. Nothing new under the sun, y'all. Listen. Do you expect your pastor to have integrity? Do you expect him to tell the truth? If I cheated on that woman sitting right there that I've been faithful to since we married, would you want to come hear me? Listen. And yet there's men standing in pulpits every Sunday that the congregation knows that that man has cheated on his wife. And because they don't want to upset the apple cart, they just keep going every Sunday listening to that garbage. Something wrong with that. Something wrong with that. Listen, it's not just us being able to teach the Bible. I know men who've committed adultery on their wives that can teach the Bible way better than me. And that means absolutely nothing to the Lord. Doesn't mean anything to the Lord. God expects us to have a purity in our lives where we're willing to stand on His behalf. Notice this, verse number 21. I've not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I've not spoken unto them, yet they prophesy. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then should have they, uh, they should have turned them from the evil of their way and from the evil of their doings. Listen. He says... Somebody is standing up and prophesying and what they're saying is not what God told them to say. Can I get this through to you right now? There are people who will stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, or the Lord told me to tell you this, or the Lord showed me this in a dream, or the Lord revealed this to me, that the Lord ain't spoke to them at all. When God speaks, He will never speak anything that's contrary to the book you have in your lap. He won't. He won't. That's why you need to be in the book, because it is the standard. It is the standard. But notice what good preaching. You know how you can kind of judge whether a pastor is telling the truth and helping people? He said, but if they had stood in my counsel, verse 22 and it caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from the evil of their way and from the evil of their doings. You know what's a good marker for me as a pastor? Is my congregation becoming more evil? Or is my congregation drawing closer to God? That's a good mark of whether that pastor is feeding the sheep like he should. Look at this, verse 29, you can read all of this, verse 29, I want you to read what it says here, start at verse 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell the dream, he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully, what is a chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord, you know what he said, some of these say I said something, 
Some of them say I did and I ain't spoke to them. And they say they got my word. Some of them say they got a dream. Right? You ever heard people say that on TV? You know what God's attitude is? That's okay. One day I'm going to fix that. What's the chaff to the wheat? Just let them stay right there. I'm fixing to fix this in just a little bit. When harvest time comes, I'm going to fix this problem. Verse 29. Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? You know what's going to fix this in the end? You know what's going to correct everybody who is a liar in the end? going to be God's word. His word's like a fire. You know what he's going to do one day? All that chaff. He's going to burn it up with unquenchable fire. So you don't worry. One day he's going to separate the chaff from the wheat. His word's going to be like a hammer. I'm telling you, it can chisel away at the vilest hearts. I've seen some really hard-hearted people that the word of God get in there and soften their heart. That's why we need to be preaching the word of God. Amen? Alright, let's introduce this, if we can, for next week. We'll go to Zechariah 13 and we'll close for the day. Zechariah 13. Zechariah chapter 13. I hope this series was a blessing to you. I try to do my best to, to explain it. Um, and again, it's not personal against any of you guys. This is... Areas of improvement that I need to make in my own life. And I have sought to work on this. Watch what he says here. Verse number 7. Awake, O sword. This is Zechariah 13, 7. Zechariah, then Malachi in the Old Testament. And that's the end of the Old Testament. He says, Awake, Zechariah 13, 7. O sword against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand upon thine little ones. Let me say something to you. Jesus is going to quote this passage right before his crucifixion. What I want to start next week is show you this. A lot of pastors go through life pretending like he doesn't need you. I don't understand how they can do that. Like they, they run roughshod over the sheep as if he don't need them. Can I let you in on something? I don't care what you've done, Edwin. I don't care the struggles you've had in your life. I don't care how bad people think it was. I need you. They may not need you. But I need you. I need you whole. It goes for everybody sitting here. Let me tell you something. Smite the shepherd. And the sheep will scatter. There's a grave danger to the shepherd. If the shepherd's going to tell the truth and lead his flock, he's got wolves after him. David slew a bear and a lion and a giant. So he's got bears, he's got lions, he's got giants after him. You need to do, and we'll talk about these things next week, there's some things you need to do to support a man who's willing to stand for you so valiantly. There's some things you need to do to help him. Listen, this can go for children in a home too. You've got a godly mo- mother or father who's a good shepherd to you. Listen to me. You need to do some things to support them and defend them. Stand for them. Because there's a lot of enemies that are looking to upset the home and upset the church. I preached a long time ago, one of the earlier messages I preached. I went to that Syrophoenician woman 
who went to Jesus and asked for healing for her daughter and he said it's not meat to take the dog's bread and cast it or the children's bread and cast it to dogs and she said yea Lord even the dogs eat the scrap that fall from the master's table and I preached on this I started thinking about it that's all we are sometimes just a bunch of dirty dogs isn't it a blessing we get scraps from the master's table? He called her a dog. That was a compliment in my eyes. It wasn't meant to be a compliment. But you know what? Haven't you seen the pictures of sheep dogs that have been ripped from one end to the other? Defending sheep and them sheep over there nudging against that sheep dog and comforting them because they know that sheep dog hadn't stood his ground, them wolves would have tore him to shred. And I got a message, Lord, make me a sheep dog. If I got to be a dog, make me that dog because I want to defend the flock. And I'm telling you, anybody who stands in defense for God's flock going to take a lot of wounds and so you need to support them I'm not saying lift them up and put them in the place of God do you understand me you be careful how high you exalt a pastor but if he's willing to stand and take the heat on your behalf when the time comes you may have to stand for him and support him Moses couldn't hold his hands up, y'all. He got weary. And you know what? Aaron and her went over there and held his hands up. And when they got tired, you know what they did? They propped some stones under him and held him steady till the battle was done. You know what we need in this church? We need some Aaron and hers. I'm not saying I'm Moses because I'm not that godly. I wish I was. But we need some people that will stand and hold the hands up when the pastor's weary. Because there are times when I get weary, the fight gets fierce, and that's what we need. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. The enemies that face the shepherd next week. Amen? Let's stand for prayer.